Well, hi there, Gatherites. Welcome back. We are now going to do video number four in our series of four Bible studies on the kingdom of God. And look, the blanket backdrop is back. I hung blankets on the wall behind me for the first two videos, and that didn't go over very well. But this is a pretty blanket with kitty cats on it. I thought maybe you would, I, I really, you don't like this one either? Well, okay then. I'll just take it down and you have to look at whatever's behind the blanket, I guess. I don't know. I never saw such a blanket phobic group of people in my life. Oh my goodness. Look what's behind the blanket. It's real live kitty cats. Wow. That's a surprise. Yeah. I tell you, that is a surprise. I hope they're not too distracting, but if they are, it's your fault because you're the one who didn't like the blanket. There's going to be a lot of surprises in store for us. That's kind of the whole topic of our Bible study for this month. We're now going to talk about life in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, beyond death. And the one thing the Bible says more clearly than anything else is that it will be a life filled with surprises. For three months, we have been talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, eternal life. And we have said over and over again that contrary to a lot of popular ideas about uh, the kingdom of God, most of the time when that phrase is used in the Bible, it refers to life here and now. Life that is ruled by God, life the way God wants it to be. Most of the time, Jesus and the gospel writers are concerned with the quality of our lives this side of the grave. Life after death does not get nearly as much attention in the Bible as people might think. But it does get some attention. And so that is what we are going to talk about this month. Life in heaven with God after we die. What will that life be like? Before we look at the scriptures, it might be fun to just think about all the popular conceptions that people have. The first thing that might come to mind is little angels floating around on clouds and playing harps. That's what heaven will be like. We'll all have wings and we'll all play harps. We'll play really well, I imagine, like Andreas Wollenweiler. But there's actually nothing about that in the Bible. Somebody will mention pearly gates and streets of gold. And you know what? Those are in the Bible. The book of Revelation, chapter 21. But perhaps the number one misconception about life in heaven is that it will be up in the sky somewhere. While the Bible pretty consistently says that it will be here on earth. That's right. Belinda Carlisle knew better and she got it right. Ooh, baby, heaven is a place on earth. She's another of my favorite theologians along with Karen Carpenter. Life forever with God will not be up in the sky somewhere. It will be right here on earth. Uh, sort of. Actually, there will be a new earth that replaces this one. One very similar to this one, but without any of its problems. We will say more about all of that in the Bible study. But right now, I want to take a little detour just to ask, how many sermons have you heard about life in heaven? or life after death, maybe lots. But growing up Lutheran, 
I actually have not heard very many. And a lot of other Lutherans tell me the same thing. There are churches where that is the main thing you hear about every week. The gospel promise is basically believe in Jesus and you will go to heaven when you die. And then there's lots of details about how wonderful that life in heaven with Jesus will be. Well, that's fine, I guess, if that's what you are looking for when you go to church. But that's not usually what I get in a Lutheran church. Lutherans usually focus much more on life here and now, being faithful to God in this good world that God has given us. I like being Lutheran, but it is just possible to go too far if we never talk about heaven or almost never, you know, maybe just at funerals. Well, we could be missing something that's pretty exciting, and something that Jesus and Paul and almost all the authors of the Bible did talk about quite a bit from time to time. And you know, in the church, there are thousands of hymns about heaven and the glories of the afterlife, hymns and spirituals and popular songs, swing low, sweet chariot, in the sweet by and by, when the roll was called up yonder. Growing up Lutheran, I was aware of a lot of those songs, but we didn't sing them very often. And there aren't too many hymns about heaven, the afterlife, and the ELW. I do like the ones that are there. But I have to wonder, why don't Lutherans talk and sing about this more than they do? I don't know the reason, of course. I, I'm just guessing. But I wonder if it might have something to do with the fact that we are mostly a middle class denomination. Most people in most of our churches have relatively comfortable lives. It is easier to talk about being thankful for the life we have in this good world God has given us when life is pretty comfortable and usually pleasant. The promises of heaven are especially meaningful to people for whom life in this world is rarely comfortable or pleasant. And there are a lot of people for whom that is unfortunately true. The Lutheran pastor often says, instead of thinking about the life to come, we should focus on the wonderful life that God has given us right now, on the blessings that God gives us every day, and on all the opportunities we have for doing good. Well, I agree. I'm just saying it's easier to preach that sermon in a middle-class congregation than maybe some other location where the blessings and opportunities are harder to find. In any case, another one of my favorite theologians, this Irish guy named Bono, said, I have climbed highest mountains, I have run through the fields, and I still haven't found what I'm looking for. What he means, of course, he has said in interviews, is that all of us are ultimately looking for something that cannot be found in this world or in this life, even when life is very good. It's not what it can be. It's not all that it should be. So the Bible urges us to be a little impatient with God, to pray, come Lord Jesus, to pray that repeatedly every Sunday. Of course, we're thankful for what we have now, but it is not all, not everything. It is just a foretaste of the feast to come. I like the foretaste. But every now and then, I just want to say, enough with appetizers. Bring on the feast. Can't we have it now, please? 
soon and very soon, Andre Crouch sang, we are going to see the king or queen or whoever you want to imagine our triune God to be. And then, then we will find what we are looking for. So for the time being, we are urged to imagine what life on earth will be like when it is forever and perfect. We have to use our imaginations because almost everything the Bible says about the life to come is symbolic and mythological. And there's so much imagery that we probably shouldn't take too literally. I mean, will there literally be 12 gates, each of which was carved from a single pearl? And if so, Will there be oysters around capable of producing such pearls? I mean, those would be some really big oysters. We have to use our imaginations because so much is beyond rational understanding. The Bible says with absolute clarity that there will not be any marriage in heaven. What? Husbands and wives won't be married anymore? I mean, that sounds terrible. But it isn't. Don't worry. You will still be just as close to your spouse in heaven as you were here. Even closer. And you will be more in love than ever before. But the thing is, you will also be in love with everyone else and just as close to them. On earth, marriage isn't just about being close to someone. It is about being close to one person who is special, being closer to that one person than you are to anyone else. And that is what will change. It's hard for us to imagine, I know. It might be easier to imagine than to understand. And that's what we're going for, imagination, not understanding. So, will your dog go to heaven? Of course, why not? All my lovely kitty cats are going to be in heaven, I assure you. And they will get bored if there aren't dogs to play with them. Seriously. The Bible often speaks about animals in paradise. Lions and lambs and wolves and bears. In fact, the number one paradigm in the Bible for understanding the world beyond death is the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2 and 3. That is what heaven will be like. Naked humans in the garden with all the animals. And Isaiah says that, yes, the serpent will be there too, but now he will be harmless. <clears throat> Just as an aside for any of you who hate snakes, I'm sorry to tell you this, but there will be snakes in heaven. The Bible says so. But, you know, you'll have time to work that out. Where did we ever get the idea that only human beings go to heaven? I know. There was a time, not so much anymore, but there was a time when a lot of Christians read Plato, the philosopher. And according to Plato, only human beings have souls. And only souls survive death. So people who read Plato decided that when animals die, they're just dead. But when people die, they have souls that can go to heaven. Well, you can listen to Plato if you want. I mean, he was pretty smart, but that's not the picture we get in the Bible. In the Bible, people are in paradise with all the animals, and they're not just souls, but they have bodies. Their bodies go to heaven. Not these bodies, but better bodies. 
in the Bible, all living things have souls. Soul is the life that a being has. Also not to push the point too far, but both Isaiah and John the Baptist did say, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. I mean, they could have said all people, but they didn't. They said all flesh. Kitty cats have flesh, so do dogs, so do fish and parakeets. Plato was very smart, but he had not read the Bible. A lot of it hadn't even been written yet. All right, I might be losing you, so let me quickly return to what I said before. This is all imagination. We don't know how literal any of this should be taken. Maybe it's all symbolism and what actually comes to pass will be something that we never could have possibly imagined. And if anybody watches this video that I'm making right now in heaven, they might just laugh and laugh at the foolishness of it all. That could be another reason Lutherans don't talk a lot about the great beyond. Lutherans like knowing things. We are very good at doctrine and at developing statements of faith. We are less good at appreciating mystery and symbolism. We're better at believing things to be true than we are at imagining what could or might be true. We're better at confessing creeds than we are at confessing ignorance. So we're left now with a lot of symbols and images that don't yield exegesis, but might appeal to our imagination. I'm getting near the end, and I want to ask you, what is the greatest thing of all about that our future holds for us? It is the single hardest thing in the Bible to believe. That could be a good discussion question. What is the single hardest thing in the Bible to believe? A man walking on water? A virgin giving birth? Oh, no. This is way harder than that. And what is the greatest thing of all that our future holds for us? I might have thought being with Jesus being with Jesus forever. But eh, no, that's probably number two. The number one greatest thing of all is expressed in one Bible verse. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. But we know this, when he is revealed, we will be like him when we see him as he is. What the Bible says is that when we are in heaven, we will not just be with Jesus, we will be like him. We, all of us, miserable sinners, we will be like Jesus, not just his servants or his disciples, but his friends and companions. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, we will be holy, pure, and faultless. We will be perfect people, as perfect as Jesus himself. I think that is the single hardest thing in the Bible, to believe. But believe it, I do. It is our future. Someday, we will all be perfect people living in a perfect world. And our pets, they'll all be perfect too. They don't really like posing, but one does. This one up here, 
His name is Augustine. Hey there, Augustine. Do you have anything to say to the Gatherites? Hmm? Do you have anything to say? Maybe? Yeah? Well, you'll get to meet him someday in heaven. Thank you all for your attention.